Welcome to another episode of the Talking NorCal podcast, Active NorCal's official podcast. I am your host, Zach O'Brien. With me here, as always, it's Cliff Bar Bob. How you doing, Bob? I'm Cliff Bar Bob now. Yeah, I'm good. Feeling full of Cliff Bars. I like that nickname. It really rolls off the tongue. I made it up in a video that can't go viral, but apparently you liked it. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay. Uh, today, we do have a fantastic interview with Kevin McKee. He actually just recently purchased Anderson Valley Brewing Company, brand new owner of a longtime brewery here in Northern California, right there in Boonville, California. Um, so we talk about all things craft beer, including their legendary Boonville, Boonville Beer Festival and the town's epic language that they have, Bootling. So before we get into that, please take a second right now, subscribe to this podcast, the Talking NorCal podcast. Uh, we're everywhere. Anywhere you get your podcasts, subscribe to us. Uh, we're also stepping up our social media game. So follow Talking NorCal on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and now we do have a YouTube page so you can go and see all the video highlights of our show. We should probably start a TikTok soon, right? Absolutely. A, t a Talking NorCal TikTok. We're going to work on that. Uh, but follow us for now to watch us in action on this podcast. All right, you ready, Bob? Let's hop in to this episode with the Tahoe's Hella NorCal. NorCal, we're Hella NorCal. And I could spend all day just chilling in the South Bay. We're NorCal, we're Hella NorCal. And Darren knows how to do to kick it down in Santa Cruz. We're NorCal, we're Hella NorCal. And we get a little cray cray when we visit the East Bay. We're NorCal, we're Hella NorCal. So you may be listening to this on a podcast format, and we appreciate that listen, but we've also upgraded our studio here for video capabilities. I think the new trend in podcasting is recording everything video, sort of like a talk show. Yeah. And so we've really stepped up our game here recently. We decorated our area to put a little bit more uh, texture, I guess I you'd call plant. it. You got a plant, plant right behind here. you. We may or may not keep that. We're going to continue adding to the studio. We're not interior designers. That We are far from it. Far from it. And uh, But we, we really want to continue just reaching you guys wherever we can. So we got this whole new setup. I'm going to try to buy some new stuff. This is actually, it's like a we can't nail anything to the wall. Cement wall. It's a cement wall. So... We're doing our best. Uh, Bob here has really stepped his game up with our camera situation. Isn't that right? Yeah. We've got some new toys. Well, what's, I mean, what are all these cords? I don't know anything about Well, this. I mean, we have to sync audio and video. We now have two cameras instead of just one. Um, both Canon cameras. Uh, they're both DSLR. I don't know. I just upgraded big time. Uh, we're going to try to do some live stuff. Maybe we do a segment or two live on this uh, Talking NorCal feed. Uh, we'll see. But we have all that capability now. And so I just, you know, it's during quarantine. Everybody's kind of stepping up their digital game and we are the same. That's I want to go live. I want to do live podcast segments. I want to do letters to the editor for Active NorCal. I want to read them out live. I think that would be, I mean, I get all sorts of weird people sending us stuff. So I just want to read them out to the public. I want to do that in a live setting in our little studio here. We have full capabilities to do so now. Yeah, this is going to be fun. I, you know, I just think we're, we're going to, we want to grow our, our video audience at the same time as growing our audio, audio audience. Audio audience. Yeah. That's what I'm going to say. Yeah. Digital production. Now, now that we can, people can see us. They're seeing your shirts, and your shirts have been off the charts lately. What's going on here? Well, I mean, we're still under quarantine. I'm still up on the heavier side, so my <laughs> limit, uh, the limit of shirts that fit me uh, adequately, are limited. This is one of them. This is a. These a, are Fat Bob shirts. These are Fat Bob shirts. Yeah, it's Cl Cliff Bob. Cliff Bar Bob, Fat Bob, whatever. I Cl okay, just Cl keep going. Just oh, call just Cliff call Bar. me whatever you want. This is a Cliff. I think it's a Quicksilver shirt, but I've had it for years. It does jump out. Uh, but yeah, all I of wore. The I wore a, a sh shiny shirt just to sort of. Match I really you. like that shirt. It's Pride Month too, isn't that? Isn't it Pride Month? I think. I don't think so. I'm pretty sure it's Pride. Is month. it? Yeah, I didn't know. Pretty sure. It's Pride uh, month. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, your shirt last week was was just crazy. 
visual and electric. all over the place. Electric. And I'm like, well, I'm sure he's going to he's gonna tone that back a little bit. But you're coming in hot today. I, I can't like wear it. a lot of T-shirts right now. They just are just emphasizing everything I don't want emphasized. So uh, it's all button-ups for me right now. And uh, the ones that fit me are limited. So, yeah, I, and they're all just so happen to be absolutely bright and wild. I do like the nickname Cliff Bar Bob. So let's hear it. Why... Are we now going to start calling you Cliff Bar Bob? So I'm hosting a concert uh, for Cliff Bar a little later this month. And at the end of it, I wanted to do kind of a video, music video montage of all of Cliff family employees. Kind of us saying, we haven't seen our customers in a long time. Here's what we look like at home and just have fun with it. It's to a Queen song. And so I needed to, I'm going to put that together. I'm producing it, but I need everyone to send me their basically play the song and react to it and record yourself doing it as easy as that and send me the video and I'm going to edit it together. So in doing so, I had to create a instructional video to all of the Cliff family employees. And in doing so, I had to make this video myself. And so I made a viral video that can't go viral because I don't own the copyright of the song. Um, it's a problem. And, and at the bottom, I put my name in several places because I wanted to show these people I'm going to be putting your name in this video. So just let me know what your name is and how you want it to look. And one of those names was Cliff Bar Bob. And so that's where you got it. Bob made a viral video, a video that would probably go viral. Yeah. And he cannot show anybody because he, he used a copyright, a copyrighted song. The company I've, that I made it for does have the rights to be able to use a song. I just can't personally put it out there. That's my jam, by the way. That's It's Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. That's the song I used to play like before I played hockey games. So you remember Shaun of the Dead? Yes. So there's a, there's a scene. I Googled it yesterday trying because I was like, I know there's a video montage in a movie that I remember. It's, it's And so I Googled it. Shaun of the Dead, they're in the bar, and the karaoke machine like starts, and it's on. And he's like, oh, well, who then, put this song on? He's like, it's on random. And it just starts, and they, they're then they beating the zombie to the beat of that right. song. It's, no, it's, it's, it's electric. a very pumped up song. I'm yeah. surprised you didn't use that, uh, because I'm happy. So That's I like suggested the song you that song, that. and uh, the like three people that were decision makers hated that song. And I'm like, my brother, like my brother, like dances every time he hears that song. I, and you that's can't the kind not of vibe. Dance. But that that song, that that Queen song, makes me absolutely. I'm just I'm just dance. disappointed. We can't show anyone the ridiculousness. It is an insane video. Very good. Will probably would have probably go, gone viral. Um, we'll find. We'll try to find a way to get it out into the public. See what we can do. But Bob's just coming in hot lately. He's got new nicknames. He's got crazy shirts. He's got a whole studio set up around us. I don't even know what to do with. I'm myself. also using this new equipment. I'm doing wine tastings from home. So like people are signing up. They're buying wine and then they're mm -hmm. having me through their video screen teaching them about what they're drinking. So like I got all these new things going on. It's fun. Quarantine has sucked but it's been good to us i think i think it's allowed us to really step out of our comfort zone and try new things and i'm, I'm definitely out of my comfort zone weight wise in quarantine <laughs> you you are at an uncomfortable weight hey welcome welcome to the club this uh you know i i'm a fat kid on the way over here today i i saw a guy it was right on the corner and he looked swollen and i just like i, I feel you bro like i just and the heat's coming Oh man, the heat it's, is gonna. It's tough. It's, it's tough when right you're now. a bigger man. Oh, big it's time. tough. Okay, so that we we had our fun at Bob's expense, of course. but uh, nonetheless, check us out on like YouTube or Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We're gonna put all these videos up because we have all these capabilities now. And so go check us out on any one of those, the one you're most familiar with, and see Bob's ridiculous shirt. Um, okay, enough of that. Let's get to the news of the week. All right, first NorCal note of the week, Yosemite National Park announces plan to reopen this week. Really exciting. We knew this was coming, and they just announced it would be June 5th. They said it would be in June, but they... they are we in phase three of California's reopening I mean, yet? not officially, but I feel like unofficially. We're pretty much yeah, there. Yeah, so they, they came out and said they're waiting until phase three until they officially reopen, and then they just said, all right, we're going to open on June 5th. Now... It's limited. It, you have to have had a pre-existing reservation or wilderness permit or a half dome, half dome hiking permit. 
in order to go into the park. So they're really limiting the opening. I think it's actually a great way to open it up since they had all these reservations. Instead of canceling, let's let people start trickling in instead of just opening the floodgates. Right. But this is obviously huge news. Now, they they do plan on fully reopening. Well, I quote-unquote fully reopening. They're going to try to keep the park at 50% capacity. And they're going to do that by basically an online lottery. So if you if you already have like a wilderness permit or a half tow permit or a camping permit, you could come in. But otherwise, if you want to just visit, you need a day use permit, which you apply for online, and then they just randomly choose people. So I I don't know how many you know, I, I, how many people they're going to get into this lottery sy- system. But I think it said they're allowing 3,600 vehicles per day and about 1,900 that are allowed to stay overnight. That's 50% capacity. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, and every single day it's going to sell out. You know, it's a lottery, so everyone's going to show up. It's Yosemite National Park is my favorite outdoor destination on the planet, period. I've probably can't, we've talked about it a lot. I've camped there probably four or five times, all with uh, my, one of my best friends and filmmaker, Alex Gino. We refer to it as Yosemite. Uh, it just came up when we, one of our first trips there, we called it Yosemite. We still have, we always have, and we so, just love it. Sounds it sounds biblical. Yeah, it was it's pretty. kind of got that biblical sound to I it. I think we're maybe heavily intoxicated when we came up with it. Um but yeah, uh, one, I can't wait to get there. You know, I, I'm not in the lottery at this point. I didn't have a pre-existing pass, but I can't wait to get there. Uh, we've talked about how the hike to Half Dome is what I want to do. I tried it once. I was wearing DC shoes and not hiking boots. I don't recommend doing that. I didn't make it. Um, but yeah, I, I actually just had a thing pop up in my timeline on Facebook that it was seven years ago that I was there when I did the DC hike up Half Dome. We keep talking about how lucky these rangers are that have the entire park to themselves. And now these people, which we are filming, we're recording this on June 4th, so it literally opens tomorrow. These people who had their pre-existing wilderness permits in basically early, early March would have been the latest you could have, uh, you could have gotten one. So there's probably not going to be a lot of people there. They're going to have this whole place to themselves. I mean, there's 141 campsites just at uh, the Lower Pines and North Pines campground. They're all open. So they're going to see a lot of wildlife. They're going to see, I mean, right now is peak waterfall season in Yosemite. And, and you know, because there haven't been people there, though, all the wildlife's out. There's, there's, it's such a big park that while you do see people when you're out backpacking, it's not like you're uh, completely surrounded by people. So having a very limited amount of the people that are already fairly limited when you're out there, yeah, it's gonna be the people that are gonna go are gonna get the greatest experience. It's, it's crazy. It's so they can typically handle about 18,000 people a day, a little, well, it, it's, they can handle more than that, but that's that's typically like an average day, 18,000 people. So I can't imagine that that many people, you know, how many thousands of people have signed up with wilderness permits? Two, maybe? Like, this place is going to be empty. So I don't know when they're actually going to open it to the public with the lottery season, ma- season system, lottery system, but... I, maybe that's when they're going to wait until uh, phase three of the reopening. Um, but this is this is cool. This is the final national park in Northern California to reopen. It's by far the busiest. It's the biggest. My favorite. It's great. So we'll continue to follow the story. Uh, I, I would. I mean, I, I just think Yosemite is going to be fantastic this year just because they're limiting it to 50 percent. Typically, it's super crowded. So even if you think you won't get a permit, just go online, just go to their website and try for it. Why not? I think the problem is that they're I, they're only announcing it like two days beforehand. So you really got to be committed and then you still might not get it and you have to open up your plans two days in advance well people are antsy they've been locked inside so i'm sure they're they're ready and raring to go true so this summer in yosemite is going to be a historical year so just know that 
And if you want to take that leap, this might be the year to do it. If you go and you take pictures, don't forget to hashtag Active NorCal. Hashtag and might as well throw in Talking NorCal while you're at it. That, that's right. Um, okay, next story. State officials quietly reopen 145 parking lots to California state parks. Super quiet. Very. They, we're not. We're, we're going to be loud about it, though. I, I We were three days late on this story because they didn't announce it. You know, no one knew that they were. People were just showing up, and it started to grow. And then, you know, people started creating a, a list online of what is open. Obviously, they're doing this. They're not trying to market themselves as open, so they get a floodgate of people coming in. But 253 of the 280 state parks in California are now open to the public with parking lots accommodating 50% of their typical traffic. So it's a long list, and, and most of them are open, although there's some pretty good ones that are still closed. Castle Craig's is still closed. Um, but it, it's a great list, and I recommend it come go to activenorcal.com and see the list because there's a lot of stuff now open in NorCal. Yeah, and uh, you know that's what we're here to talk about. So while they might be quiet about it, and that's probably a good idea. They're like, let's just open and just kind of not tell anybody. That's hey, it's a good, it's a good way of kind it's of smart. doing it in a gentle way. Uh, but we're gonna scream it from the rooftops because we're here to get people out and active. And as long as you are abiding by all of the rules and make sure to social distance accordingly, uh, get out and stay active. It's important to do so. Well, and be prepared to turn around because it, it, 50% of capacity is not many people allowed in these areas. Um, but it's, it's, it's going to be an interesting year as far as outdoor destinations are concerned. It's all anyone wants to do. We're seeing it with the traffic on our website that people are so curious about what's open because, well, there, you know, you, even if a restaurant is open, you don't necessarily want to go dine in, right? I, I don't. No, I'm not. I'm not there yet. My, you know, my wife and I have said, okay, we might do like one a month, and like just, just, just to support these people and go dine in and have some drinks and try to spend some more money. But we don't necessarily want to. It right. doesn't sound like you know the way we'd probably rather just get takeout. So, um, so it's going to be interesting now that. The, the California State Parks is asking people to continue to recreate locally, stay close for home, not travel too far um, because they're, you know, even though you can't really tell with all the crap that's going on, there still is a coronavirus out there. But, the, I mean, there are, I would say, 80% of outdoor destinations are now open in Northern California. It's great news. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, okay, let's get to the next story. A family of coyotes settles in Sacramento's busy midtown neighborhood right down the street from my house. Yeah, the, this. so everyone's just talking about the San Francisco coyotes, and rightfully so. I mean, San Francisco is has a much denser population, and the photos and videos of the coyotes in San Francisco have been pretty iconic. But this is a family of coyotes that is just living in like downtown Sacramento and like they know exactly where they're living and they're living in like this dirt mound. And there are a ton of videos and photos of these, these guys just running around. Now uh, the, uh, the P the city officials have said that they're urban coyotes, quote unquote, urban coyotes. So they're kind of in their natural habitat, but they can't be running around. Midtown has a ton of dogs and cats and coyotes, um, are famously aggressive with house pets. I was uh, I was far less shocked by this story than I was the coyotes being in in San Francisco because, I mean, I live close to the Midtown neighborhood. It's got really it's very close to the American River, and there's a lot of kind of ju- there's a lot of homeless people over there, and they leave a lot of junk, and there's a lot of kind of things for animals like that to eat, and to it's a there's a lot of wooded area. And, Sacramento used to be known as the city of trees. So there's a lot of wooded area. I mean, it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, if there's coyotes that cross the Bay bridge or the golden gate bridge to get into the city of San Francisco, yeah, this is a no brainer. Like they're in their natural habitat. sounds a little bit of a stretch, but Hey, 
I mean, I've seen crazier things. What are they eating? Are they eating like rodents and trash? That makes sense. I mean, I think rodents are their natural diet, but I mean, I don't know. I just, I just heard about this story for the first time on ActiveNorCal.com. Yeah, I'm always fascinated. I mean, I've never seen a coyote just in the middle of a city before. Nor I, have I. Uh, it would be kind of cool to see. Uh, but I it saw is... an armadillo once in the middle of Reading. It rained in front of my car when I was 16. To this day, I swear <laughs> to God. I swear to God. That's super weird. Armadillo. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we've been following. So this is just another um, cause and effect of the quarantine because less human activity out there and they were able to sneak in and, and create a home in what is otherwise a busy area for both vehicles and foot traffic. And so I, I think I think uh, officials are going to move them. You have to you have to basically petition the state to move a coyote family. And so I think they're in the process of speaking with fish and wildlife officials to um, to move them out of the area because it is da- not only dangerous for them, but dangerous for the, the cats and the dogs and, and any humans or I don't know, kids. I don't know. I don't know. So, um, you think it's more or less paperwork to evict a uh, family of coyotes than an actual tenant in the the state of California? I know tenants have all the rights in the state of California. I mean, I'm so I'm talking about like the stack of paperwork. How much do, more paperwork? What do you think has more paperwork at this point in time? <laughs> That's a good. Do they have paperwork with coyotes? Well, I mean, they they, they you're saying they're going. Through I'm the assuming they do. Yeah. I'm just I'm just thinking out loud. Yeah, I do. Do coyote? Is there like a big file cabinet full of coyote stuff at the California Fish and Wildlife? But you would think it wouldn't take very long for them to approve it because the Fish and Wildlife office is right next to where the coyotes right. are living. Ironically enough. Um, but well, I, I just realized this when you said it, we, our next story is actually, you mentioned the, the trash on the American river. So let's, let's just, let's just segue right into it. Okay. Next story. Despite maxed out levels of E. Coli on the American river, officials won't close the beaches, which, you know, it's kind of sad. So this has been happening for three years now. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm of the opinion that we should shine a light on it. Because we just got done with Memorial Day weekend and uh, the beaches in downtown Sacramento along the American River were packed and there were people swimming and there, there's people that uh, not a lot of people like tube through there, but there are swimmers on those beaches. There are people fishing. It, they literally found the highest amount of E. coli you can possibly find in the river. And... Officials like put a little sign up that says, you know, it's, it's, there's E. coli here, but it's like small and you can't really see it. And then they put the findings of their testing, which are horrendous up on their website. But if you, if you go by, you know, to Scornia beach, it's packed. So, so the, 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 it's not a question. The officials refuse to point a finger at the problem. They say it could be Canadian geese uh, droppings. If that were the case, it would be all over. Well, There'd be a lot more Canadian geese. Well, I, I guess Canadian geese poop a lot. Yeah, I know, but like, I don't see it. You'd think you'd see a substantial amount of them in that area, and I don't see a substantial amount of them in that area. I see a lot of homeless people and a lot of people that are partying and probably doing things they shouldn't. It's it's there is a homeless problem upriver from these areas that are testing high areas that are not given proper um, proper places to put their waste. I'll, let me put it that way. Sanitation, sanitation and, and officials finally put stuff out because of the coronavirus. Right. And whatever you think about the homeless issue in California, which is, in my opinion, the, uh, the, the biggest issue that we have in this state, the state that I love so much home homelessness is probably our biggest issue. And if people have different opinions on it, I'm not going to share mine. I have compassion for a lot of these people, but we need to be able to put them in situations 
where it doesn't ruin our beautiful rivers and our beautiful outdoor destinations. And it doesn't seem like it, it's that hard of a problem, but it is. Well, uh, what's fascinating to me is they're doing a, a study on the DNA. Um, that sounds like a fun DNA sample that, to cut that, to collect. Um, <laughs> that test costs six hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars. It's over three years, and so like that's not an ast- astonishing amount of money to but me. But that's taxpayer money. But it, what really what it is is they're trying to figure out whose poop it is. Uh, the, well, that's what it comes down to. Whose DNA is this old, equal? What like species is this equal? A uh, in, in this coming from um to try to then figure out a way to fix it because right now the only thing that they did is they added a couple porta potties in those areas uh to try to leave and just like you said it was just due to coronavirus but um there are no long-term solutions or any real solutions in in place right now but hopefully with this study they can find some answers and come up with a solution yes and and t- to be clear E. coli can cause sickness to swimmers. And it's not, you're not going to have, everyone that swims in there is not going to become ill. It's approximately three out of 100 swimmers will get, you know, severely, not severely sick, but they, they will have symptoms like stomach pain. Not fun stuff. And it's a fever. All stuff that and, you don't want to hear about. Yeah, And so... The fact that they won't point to the most obvious thing that's up up river is frustrating. It's political, probably. Yes, you it know, probably is. Just the lack of of acknowledging it, because like I I don't know what way the politics lean on that or like why they wouldn't. But I live right down the street, and I'm just saying like I really don't think it's Canadian geese. <laughs> I mean, I, I, if that's I me going need... out on a political limb, I'm sorry, but like, can't they I just, give I live me? There. Can't they give me that six hundred thousand dollars? And I'll just say, hey, look, look with my own two eyes. I'm it's not, not hard. It's it's not Canadian geese. Right. I'm sorry. Right. And look, they those there are Canadian geese there, and they might add to the problem. We've, I mean. How many Canadian geese are at Manzanita Lake and Lassen? That's the most pristine water you've ever seen. In and your that's life. not flowing. Yeah, that's it's not a lake. Uh, yeah, uh, it's. Look, I am no libertarian, but if there is an argument against, you know, bureaucratic bullshit, it's the fact that they're spending three years to do this test instead of trying to fix the problem. And it is completely polluting our beautiful river. And it's just in that area, and the river does its job of cleaning it out as it gets downstream. And most people that go in the American River, it's above there, right? It's it's in the uh, eastern sections of Sacramento. But um, it, it frustrates the hell out of me because uh, it seems like there's a pretty simple, maybe not simple, but there is a solution. And the fact that we're not, you know, jumping at that solution is very frustrating. I think acknowledging the problem is the first step. Yeah, acknowledging you have a problem right. is the first. <laughs> anyway, I get like super amped up about this, and that's why we've written about it a ton on the website. Is because I just how 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 is this not bigger news? How are people not more frustrated? How are city and state officials not more frustrated? End of rant. All right, last story. We have spawning of winter Chinook salmon begin in Livingston Stone National Fish, fish Hatchery. The, so Livingston Stone is right below Shasta Dam, and I, I think Coleman Fish Hatchery gets a lot more press, right? Or a lot, you know, because they can have visitors there, and it's a whole exciting. But uh, Livingston, Livingston Stone is a is an important part of salmon runs in Northern California. Historically, salmon, you know, went all the way up the Sacramento River into, you know, the Pitt River and McLeod and all those different arms. And now there's dams. They have Keswick Dam and Shasta Dam. They obviously can't get there. So Livingston Stone, by the way, it's the only hatchery in the world that raises listed winter Chinook salmon. But uh, the officials there, they actually grab the salmon that are coming back to spawn in there and where they are originally, you know, 
hatched, I guess you would call it hatch, where there were babies. Um, and they have to put them in a truck and take them upstream to up to near the Shasta Dam from Keswick Dam. Um, but th- this is, it's just an important process for the salmon runs. And it's really cool how they do it. I mean, they, they really look at the DNA of each of these salmon and they take the eggs out and they make sure that they're not related. So I don't know what you call that salmon incest. I, they don't want, you know, salmon that are related to spawn with each other. And then they, you know, hatch baby salmon and raise them to a certain level and then release them back. And they, it's, it's an ongoing process. So these fish that are returning this year, um, were released from that facility probably three years ago. Um, I love the story. I mean, first off, Chinook salmon are huge. Uh, they can be. And, and so it's really exciting for the community that these fish are, you know, they're spawning again. Well, for those not familiar, salmon, once they spawn, they basically die. They spawn and then they die. And so one of the things, and I saw this on Instagram um, before the story on Active NorCal came out, but I found fascinating, and I didn't know this, that there's a whole, like, crew that goes up and down the river all during the salmon spawning season, and they're just there to just kind of spot dead salmon who have died because, you know, of natural causes because they've already spawned. Uh, And what they do is they collect these dead fish, and they identify them by gender, length, and if the fish was uh, from the hatchery, or if it was born on the river, uh, just to kind of keep kind of, I guess it's a census, if you will, of the river. And... I don't know. I, I think some people would probably find that gr- that job kind of gross. You know, you're just kind of messing with dead fish. Super cool. Well, our dad, gr- we grew up, our dad would do this with, uh, he'd help fish and game uh, do surveys of, of the bugs that would run in certain streams. And he, you know, and so we, we saw our dad collected bugs when we were a kid. So maybe that's why I don't think it's that, that weird. I also learned how to completely fillet fish in culinary school. So I'm used to handling dead fish all the time, but I found that that was fascinating. Um, you know, we talk about how people that are like park rangers at places like Yosemite, um, they get the, they love being in the outdoors. And so they get their dream job of being in a place that they love and just kind of hanging out. Imagine having the job of just drifting up and down a beautiful river, like the Sacramento river. And yeah, you're collecting dead fish, but it's, for science and i don't personally think it's that gross i think it's really cool so to be clear they're not collecting the fish they grab it they analyze it and they put it back right because decomposing salmon are huge to the uh the environment the biology of the river and the the area around the river yeah not just the river yeah correct so that yeah so they te- they they grab it off the floor, a dead salmon. They analyze it. They try to see where it's from and everything like that. Um, Sacramento River winter run Chinook salmon are listed as endangered species under both federal and state law. Uh, the NOAA considers winter run Chinook salmon among eight marine species most at risk of extinction. And now that's almost completely do well the damming i'm sure didn't help but that's fishing right I no mean, it's damming you think it's just like completely damming i mean obviously it's a combination of the two but the dam i mean the dam they're like, trophy fish and so they're not like uh uh you know like fly fishing like we do is very catch and release but those are some those are some keepers <laughs> yeah uh yeah they i the dams, I would say, are the biggest. I mean, any barrier you have for these fish not being able to spawn, uh, just completely wiped. I mean, you look at the Klamath. The Klamath salmon populations have basically gone extinct because there's so many dams there. That's why they're trying to remove them. But yeah, th- this is. It's just these fish are not only beautiful and not only native to Northern California, but they are. So you know, very on, they're on the verge of extinction. And so this process is very important to make sure we have these runs. And this is a reason why Lunker Lane in Redding is blocked off to fishing for much of the summer because they are allowing salmon to go through and they don't want to interrupt them at all. This is why the Sundial Bridge over the Sacramento River in Redding 
doesn't touch the water at all. It was designed as such to not disturb the, these endangered salmon. So this is a very important process to keep these fish, you know, not extinct. And um, it's it's cool how they do it. It's the science is really cool, and uh, we wish them luck, and we wish these salmon great luck on their journey to and from the Pacific Ocean. Absolutely. Uh, and that's it for the NorCal Notes of the Week. Okay, that does it for the NorCal Notes of the Week. Now let's head over to our interview with Kevin McGee. He is the brand new owner of Anderson Valley Brewing Company in the great Boonville, California. Um, let's head over to Kevin. All right, now we welcome onto the podcast the brand new owner of Anderson Valley Brewing Company, and we're big fans. This is Kevin McKee. Kevin, how have you been holding up right now? How's everything going at Anderson Valley? Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, we're doing okay. We're getting through this uh, pretty well. Uh, coronavirus was not in the original business plan, but um, as it turns out, um, we're actually pretty well, we're pretty well set up uh, to, to deal with it. So we've got no layoffs, no furloughs. Everybody's maintained all their hours. Everybody's got um, all their benefits. Um, we, uh, you know, had a, a hard time in the early days because there was a lot of cancellation of like draft orders and things like that. But we're uh, we're starting to get back up again and getting some momentum, which is kind of nice. Um, yeah, are yeah. are, are uh, a lot of your beer sales coming from like like bottles and different stores right now? Yeah, so it's, I mean, when you when you think about beer, it's like there's there's draft and there's package, uh, packages like cans and bottles and, and that kind of thing, and then there's like off premise and on premise, and so on premise is you drink it at the place, so that's all the restaurants and the stuff that's closed right now. So we had we had a lot of business already in off premise, like grocery stores, you know, uh, you know, large big box stores and stuff, and we had a lot of business in packaged goods, so we weren't all you know draft. So we were able to, to, to maintain you know, a lot of that. Really what, what happened with a lot of beer is uh, the distributors that were out there, there's, just, there's a lot of you know, the pantry loading where people go out and buy you know, a ton of beer for the apocalypse and stuff. And uh, what happened was that the distributors really kind of um, loaded in a lot of what they had in their warehouses. So the way it works is distributors order from us, we ship to the distributors and then the distributors get it out to the retailers and, so they, they took a lot of the stuff that they had and kind of de-risked their business right. by unloading this because they pay us when we ship it to them. They get paid when they get it to the distributor. So they, they drew down their stuff and it took them a little while. Now they're starting to come up and, and, uh, and order more from the brewery. So not, not just us. I mean, everybody really in craft is, is starting to, to, to get a little bit more, a little bit more business happening and, and things, but we're, I mean, we're, we're fortunate that we've been able to operate and, and stay in business, keep people employed and uh, that kind of thing. So we're doing okay. So we're, uh, it's nice. I mean, up in Boonville, man, we're out here. It's like there's the population density and fresh air and a lot of factors like that. Um, in addition to the idea that, I mean, we do sanitation for a living. Um, we've been able to, to kind of manage things pretty well. So hanging in there, but it's yeah, been, it's it, crazy ride <laughs> it's a weird it's a weird obstacle for a new owner of anything to have yeah. to go through something you know none of us were prepared for and and none of us could really plan for um but i am curious about you uh and the news came out and it, i guess it was late 2019 november december ish that anderson valley was sold and i'm a huge fan and my first thought was okay which big company bought Anderson Valley. And lo and behold, it was this local guy. It was you, uh, which is just so rare and refreshing to see in the craft beer industry. And I, I did a little research and I found out you are an attorney or were an attorney. Um, so what's trying your story? How did be. you're trying not to be? So, well, how did you go from law into craft beer? Um, it's a, it's a weird story. I actually, I, so I, I came out of law school and I worked as a gang prosecutor down in the Bay area. Um, and I actually used to teach other prosecutors gang trial and investigation and, uh, other stuff like that. Um, left that, went to work in a law firm, realized that despite the fact that the law firm was full of just really nice people, 
I just didn't like working in a law firm. Um, got a job working with Jess Jackson from Kendall Jackson uh, and pretty much hung out with him every day, all day for about eight years. And uh, in the process, he sent me to Stanford Business School. And that was kind of my my pivot from being lawyer guy to kind of business guy. Well, Kevin, <laughs> uh, you, you kind of touched on this a little before, so I'm going to kind of uh, ask on it again. Uh, if you haven't listened to the podcast, I'm kind of the wine guy. I uh, worked at a winery and uh, I went to Grace, CIA Greystone in St. Helena. Oh, yeah. I went to culinary school there, which kind of got me uh, in the area. And then I stumbled upon a job uh, at a tasting room in St. Helena and I've been there for a year and a half. So um, it often happens like that in this industry where you kind of just stumble into it. Uh, how, what got you, I, I know you said you were an attorney in San Francisco and then worked for uh, Jess Jackson, Jackson family, those not familiar, very reputable winery in the Sonoma County. Uh, what got you, Who? how did you get in touch with Jess specifically? That's a great company to work for. I, uh, so I, I went from being a gang prosecutor to being a litigator down in Southern California. And um, I, I wanted to kind of get out of it. And I had the absolute dumb luck and extreme good fortune to run into my future wife. And uh, <laughs> her father had been selling wine for like 50 years or something like that and was working at Jackson. So when I was looking to, to do something different and get out of the, the law firm, that was when uh, Jess discovered that he had uh, three agents in the thoroughbred horse business that had stolen basically several millions of dollars from him in the first like 20 months of being there. And he was going to get, he was going to, he was going to make that right. And so my background was really in, you know, investigations and prosecution and litigation. And you know, I was, I was purpose built for doing this kind of stuff. And I was also a total wine geek. Um, and uh, and completely horrible winemaker, which is how I make, started making beer. So I was, uh, you know, absolutely primed and ready to do that. And the other neat thing was meeting meeting Jess. I mean, Jess was a force of nature. I mean, the man was a hurricane, you know, in a pair of pants. Um, and uh, the, the pace that I was used to working in from coming out of the gang unit was really similar to the pace that he was used to working in, but he was doing it, you know, with wine and things like that. So... So it just so happened that we we just kind of had a, a similar rhythm of, you know, sort of, you know, ebbs and you know, frequencies of how we like to do stuff and hit it off, communicated well, and, uh, and he just kind of kept me around uh, for everything that he did. And I ended up running, you know, chunks of the family office and the thoroughbred business. And, um, you know, I would wake up to text messages just telling me to go to the plane instead of the office. And. It was, uh, it was a crazy, um, it was like dog years, but it was a crazy time, but wonderful people and uh, just unforgettable memories. And I'm still discovering what I learned from, from hanging out with that guy. He's pretty incredible. Hey, there's so much going on there. When you drive through, it's, it's quiet and beautiful and you can hear the birds chirping, but there's so much going on under the surface with the wine industry and, and now craft beer has sort of taken a hold. Um, I'm curious, and we actually, we do a, a book club every month, and we recently did uh, Beyond the Pale, the Ken Grossman story, his autobiography. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and what we found is, well, at least in his, in, his, uh, in his life, it took just a real science nerd to be a good craft brewer, right? He was just obsessed with the little details and the science behind it and doing it right. Uh, what brought you to brewing? What got you into it? Do you like the science? Do you, is it therapeutic? Yeah, it was. Um, so again, it was my wife. Um, so we, uh, uh, well, I, I, I had been trying to make wine for a number of years. And despite the fact that I had um, cultivated a, a lot of good friends who were extremely successful and skilled winemakers. I just made some of the worst crap you could possibly imagine. I was the world's, I would just dump, you know, carboys and stuff in the toilet, like every, you know, whatever period of time. I mean, nothing that I made was even remotely drinkable. It was like, like chrome polish. It was horrible. And so at one point, uh, my wife said, uh, yeah, I should try making beer because her brothers had made it at one point and it turned out to be pretty good. And I could probably do that. And she thought that I needed a creative outlet. So um, I uh, went down to uh, the beverage people in Santa Rosa and I picked up some, you know, a kit and 
how to figure it out. And a lot of the things that I totally nerded out on, you know, in wine, like, you know, you know, fermentation science and a lot of the chemistry and things like that was still totally applicable. So I was kind of, I had a bit of a leg up, but one of the things with beer that um, was really great was first, the first beer that I made turned out really good, which was the first time I had ever done anything like that. And so obviously, you know, luck. Totally, yeah, absolutely. It's a whole Dunning-Kruger thing. Um, and uh, so that was great. But then the next thing is that I realized that I could brew and iterate a beer on like, you know, three week cycles rather than having to wait to harvest and that kind of thing. And so just as, as, as often as I wanted to do it, I could do it. And so I had an opportunity to really develop a learning curve, which I never had with wine. So it was like with wine, it was like, I'd be really into it for a little while. And then kind of, it's like, okay, and then let it sit for six months. All right, fine. And then something would go wrong in those six months and I'd lose focus. Beer, you know, I could, could be very much on top of it. So it just kind of worked better with my brain, I guess. And I went way down the rabbit hole and she was, uh, she was telling me, she's, she's like, uh, you know, I, I can't believe I encouraged you to do something. You didn't tell me I wasn't supposed to do that because my sisters had told her, it's like, wait, you encouraged him to do this? So, and like, I'm like off and running. So next thing it's like, I'm getting, you know, I'm, I've, I've figured out how to use Ohm's law in order to wire a control panel to try and get a brew rig set up in my garage, you know, figuring out how to, you know, like I said, turn a residential garage in a you know, residential neighborhood into a commercial brewery that's got a license to produce up to you know, something like 160,000 gallons of beer a year or whatever. And, um, and then turn it into a business too. I mean, I, I, the, the actual business side of it was uh, Jess and I were redoing the business plans for all of the different uh, wine brands that we had. There was like 43 of them. And it was nuts. It was overly complicated and it was, you know, trying to figure out how to get them to kind of work together and, um, and it was, you know, it was something that nobody in the industry really did because it was super complicated, but I didn't know any better because I didn't have a background in any of this stuff and, uh, he didn't care and he was going to do it anyway. So we did it. And I think they're still, they're still basically running the structure today, but as a break, I went home and I penciled out a, a business plan for running a super tiny, you know, one barrel brew house in my garage. And I came in the next day and I told Jess that. I solved all of our inventory turn and scaling issues and iteration and you know all the other kinds of things and uh, told him that he should have been making beer for these last 25 years. And uh, we spent about half a day talking about beer. And uh, at the end of the day, he said, "You should really do this. Um, this is like this is this is a good idea." And uh, uh, should have said, "Yeah, you and me, 50-50. You know, we're in business together. Let's go." You know. I did. I, I said, well, let me prove the concept first and then we can talk about Because he was like, you're going to need stainless steel and you need to raise some funds. And yeah, I'm like, no, let me, let me, let me prove the concept first and then we can talk about it. But, um, but, uh, but now his son is, uh, um, Christopher started Seismic and they're doing great. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so wow. I talked to, yeah, I talked to Christopher just, just last week, actually. So, um, but they're doing great. He's having fun with it, too. So um, it's yeah, really it's fun. fun to turn a passion into a profession, isn't it? Yeah, well, it was, there's 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 ebbs and flows. I mean, you know, um, running a running a brewery is not like brewing. You spend ten percent of your time, you know, making beer, and ninety percent of your time trying to figure out, you know, sales and marketing and paperwork right. and you know other kinds distribution of stuff. and yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can, I mean, so if you, you can brace that stuff, that's you know, that's that's the that's the magic. But um, so you became was, a successful home brewer with a a, a good you know, business in intact. Um, and then it's time to expand. And so you start shopping around and you said, you mentioned earlier that you kind of shopped through, you know, four or five breweries that you were looking at. Um, Boonville and the Anderson Valley area is near and dear to both Zach and I's heart. The winery that I work for, uh, we grow our Gewürztraminer, which is probably my favorite varietal that we put out in Boonville. Zach really uh, has been going there since he was a kid. Other than just it probably being the best business decision, what did you love about the Boonville area? What brought you, what attracted you to that area specifically? Um, I was really familiar with uh, Anderson Valley uh, from the wine side. Um, so, and, and so I knew, you know, I, I didn't know Trey, I didn't know the former owners. Um, they were, they were fairly quiet actually in the, the craft beer world, but 
Um, on the wine side, uh, Anderson was this like totally um, underappreciated gem. I mean, the, the Pinot Noir that gets pulled out of Anderson Valley is just stunning. One of the last projects that we did before Jess passed was we pulled samples from every single one of the production vineyards that produced Pinot Noir throughout California within, within the family's holdings and tasted them all next to each other. And I, I thought, and I think Jess thought too, um, that Anderson was, was basically the best stuff. So like they've got like Champ de Rev, they've got um, Grizz Ridge was one of those. There was uh, um, you know, a few other, uh, a few of the labels that they, they put together you know, for it. And just the, the, the fruit was great. So I had been through and just kind of, you know, seen it. And I, I liked, uh, always liked the idea that I was a little bit removed. Um, and yet people here really knew what they were doing. Uh, so it was kind of a, a fairly quiet confidence in being able to do just some really world-class stuff, um, which was great. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's very real around here. You know, everyone knows each other and everyone's connected. And one of my, one of my projects that I was going to try and do and then quarantine happened was I wanted to go walk down Main Street and just start knocking on doors and introducing myself. And I've had a little speak, bit of uh, Do you speak do bootling yet? Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not even. I'm not even gonna, gonna. I'm not gonna denigrate the language of me trying to figure out how to speak. I've got. Hold on. I have a book. Oh wow! There you go. We're and it's got it's got 150 pages of Boont to English translation, so I can figure out what like you know Fal is saying when he's talking about me. You know with. Uh, um, with Rod, but uh, no, I'm not. I'm not even gonna go there. It's like you know, just, and, and we're not gonna name any more beers. Like you know, you know, ten. They're like they're like words that are like ten letters long. Eight of the letters are vowels, and there's a hyphen. It, it's and, it's uh, tough to so market something you can't say. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not gonna. But at the same time, it's like it's such a part of this area too. It's like it's hard yeah. not to not to be part of it. It's like, how do you, how do you make sure that, you know, people, people hear it and, you know, it's, and it's totally worth people knowing about it, but, you know, not, you know, get, get so tied into it that, uh, that it overwhelms what you're trying to get across. So there's a balance there. We're figuring it out. I, I remember the first time I went to Boonville, uh, I was 21. And uh, of course you could probably guess I was at the uh, Boonville uh, beer festival. Mm -hmm. Um, and we went to the local bar and I believe it's not open anymore. And you, you know, we went a night early, so there weren't the tens of thousands of people there and the locals were there and we could not understand a word they were saying. And <laughs> we were just flabbergasted. Like, where are we right now? Yeah. Um, but I, I just, I love that town. And uh, you know, I go back there now, even when it's not uh, the beer festival. Um, but I am, I am interested in this market that you recently bought into, uh, mm -hmm. the craft beer market. And it's, you know, I told you we are, our big thing, we sort of cover outdoor stuff in Northern California. And we learned very quickly that craft beer and outdoor activities go hand in hand. And so we've been following the craft beer market for a while now. And um, what, how do you see the market moving forward? How do you see, because you know, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, a lot of these small companies are selling off bigger companies. And uh, how, how do you see craft beer as an industry, especially in Northern California, sort of in 2020 and moving forward? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I'm a bit of a contrarian from um, other folks that tend to write a lot on, on the subject. I think... Uh, there's a consensus that right now is a really tough time for actually, but go back to you know, January, February. Um, January, February was considered to be a very tough time for craft beer. There's a lot of headwinds. There's 7,000 craft breweries and, you know, there's, you know, it's a, a difficult thing. And so, um, you know, the, the saying was that every brewery is for sale. If you just, you know, kind of quietly ask and, and, and give them a number. Um, I, uh, had a different view, particularly, you know, in, in 2019 and kind of coming into this year, uh, I thought it was actually, it was a great time to get involved. And, and one of the reasons is that I think that craft was already at this inflection point. It was in a, um, 
there, there was a growth stage that was evolving. It wasn't kind of, it wasn't ending, but you had a, a, an industry that was going from adolescent to early mature uh, as a consumer product. And so you had this just enormous growth curve from say 2010 um, up through 2018, 2019, uh, and it started tapering off in you know late 2017 into 18 and 19, and it there were there were a lot of breweries that were you know ringing you know alarm bells saying this is the end of you know the craft whatever. Well, it wasn't really. I mean, it really you kind of when when you peel back a bunch of stuff, one of the ways to look at it, which you know it's the way that I look at it, um, there was an enormous amount of growth that was available in you know 13, 14, 15, 16, and into 17 if you could just make liquid and put it on a truck, I mean, there really wasn't a whole lot of threshold to what you, you had to do or had to make over time, and particularly into 2017, 18, 19, um, you had breweries that were being actively encouraged and, and paid really well to really be focusing on just iterating new products, sending it out, loading into the distributor, and then working on the next thing. And it was really, very little focus on flagships. There was very little focus on, you know, entrenched and core brands. And usually when you've got a consumer products, you know, business, you have a core business and then the success of that core business gives you cash flow and gives you permission to go and do exploratory, you know, R and D and different things. And, and what was happening was the market had evolved so that, there were businesses who only did that exploratory kind of small batch, limited release, um, and then pushing, you know, boundaries of, you know, what a slushy milk stout, you know, whatever kind of glitter thing, um, you know, could be. And you, you developed a market that was absorbing this stuff, but it was very temporary. Um, the language of craft beer, the industry itself, for some reason, refers to these particular items as brands. So if I've got, you know, you know, five or six different beers that I'm putting in the market, they, they will refer to, and sometimes as distributors, refer to each like the IPA, the pale, the slushy stout, whatever. That's a brand. And it's not a brand. The brand is, is a brewery. It's got to, there's got to be a reason behind it. There's got to be you know, something real, there's got to be some, some, some gravity and, and some purpose, you know, there's a huge opportunity to, to be impactful and get a good product out to the market and, and do it by being real and just connecting um, that hadn't really been done before because it wasn't necessary. Uh, and that was kind of the opportunity that I saw and like the kind of breweries that I was looking for. I mean, Anderson Valley was kind of the first pick. It's got so much depth and authenticity and, the, the former owners didn't really do much marketing at all. And so I had, you know, I had 10 years of stories that weren't told. I mean, I've, I've got 33 years of stories, but 10 years of kind of a backlog of stuff that, that could have been talked about. Uh, and it's sad because, you know, the brewery lost a little bit of its, you know, a little bit of its, its you know, presence and, and, and whatnot. But, you know, on the one hand, you know, the, the former owners, they didn't screw anything up, clearly. I mean, the, the beer has been awesome throughout you know, the, the history of the brewery. And now I've got, you know, I've got 10 years of material that, that they didn't use that, that I can talk about. And, you know, if it's like, you know, that Walt Disney every day is a, an occasion for a parade principle, I've got content for, you know, multi-generations. So. Um, Absolutely. I, the Boonville story, I don't think, you know, maybe a couple breweries in Northern California can rival the story, but the story is so unique and local. And I, I, I 100% agree with you that that's where, you know, these breweries should be going. Um, yeah. So well, amen like, to that. And I mean, there's things like, um, so that the, the, so our brewery sources all of its water from 10 wells on the property. It treats all of its water and discharges all of its water in the property, basically into a field that, that goats eat. And, you know, we have, we have a zero impact water use for a production brewery um, in the United States. And I don't know if there's anybody else that kind of does that, but, you know, that and, you know, we're solar, we're basically zero. Waste. I mean, it's like there's so many, so many things that this brewery, starting with Ken Allen, has been quietly doing like the right thing for 33 years 
And, you know, some people know about it, but a lot of people don't. And it's like, I mean, there's, you can't kind of go back and greenwash that with, you know, some, you know, you know, other things like there's, there's nobody that's been doing that for, for 30 years. And just you the idea Kevin, yeah. that I could get involved in that kind of thing. I'm like, absolutely. I want to be part of this. This is my last job, by the way. I'm not doing anything I love else. That. I finally have one job for the first time in forever. And this is the last one. <laughs> like, well, let's talk about the future a little bit. Uh, you mentioned, you know, well, 2020 is basically the year of pivot. You mentioned kind of needing to pivot. Everyone's kind of needing to pivot. What do you see? Uh, you know, I know this is kind of a big question. What do you, what's your vision for the future of Anderson Valley Brewing Company? Uh, what obstacles do you see in the future? And for me, more exciting, do you have any exclusive uh, new exciting beers you want to tell us about? Um, yeah, we. Uh, I mean, a lot of what we're planning on doing is just trying to be better at communicating who we are and why we are. Um, I'm not changing, I mean, I, I would say I'm not doing anything, you know, to, to any of the recipes. I mean, it's like, you know, I don't want to come in and be like, you know, we need more cowbell, you know, when they're making you know, the white album. You know, that's <laughs> Great reference. Um, but, uh, there, there's, there's some things that we're doing, um, like we don't really have, or at least we didn't have, we're trying to have right now. We didn't really have a good offering in sort of the, the blonde golden ale category is one of the biggest categories that's out there. We made Boonville Gold, um, I think last year, and they kind of launched it. And it, it, it was actually something that one of our distributors asked for, and, and then they didn't really pick it up, and now we're with a different distributor. Um, and it's taking off. Uh, so there's like, there's things like that. Um, I think, you know, our, our, like our pale ale, Polico Pale, is such a good beer, and it's just kind of fallen off the, the, the the you know the consciousness of a lot of folks that would like it so trying to figure out how to get that back in people's hands so that they can they can find it same thing with hop out and then, so between the three of them it's like you got you know ipa pale ale and golden ale and those are the three biggest categories in beer so um three areas that we were we were under um underperforming in with uh, in my view you know superior products to a lot of stuff that's out there you know, if, if you if you taste our beer and you don't like it, man, that's cool. I mean, it's not 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 your jam. But I need to give people the opportunity to have that that choice and have that evaluation. So that's really a lot of what we're doing. I'm, I'm looking at a board. I've got a whole architecture of brands that kind of redone up on on the wall. Um, but we've got, I mean, we've got a couple things going on. Um, so we we've got a beer that I'm super excited about. And I'm trying to figure out how how we do it right and do it in a way that, you know, kind of respects the beer and gives it, you know, an, an honorable chance. And uh, Fal made a black rice ale. And so he was cooking with black rice, the, the forbidden rice, um, and got this really great flavor. And he's like, I wonder if this would be in a beer. And so he made the black rice ale and it's great. It's, um, it basically just, it just won a competition for best brown ale in California. Um, but it's like 3%, 3.8% alcohol and it's under hundred calories, but it tastes wow. like, it tastes like a brown ale. It tastes like an actual craft beer. And you know, they just launched it, uh, in the fall, but they didn't really kind of do a launch. They didn't do any promotion. They just kind of, you know, when they launched it, the former ownership, they just kind of like sent it to the distributor and said, here, sell this. And my view is it's our responsibility to, to, to sell stuff. It's the distributor's responsibility to kind of get it out there in the market so they can do stuff. So, so we need to, um, we need to launch it and, uh, and give it kind of an opportunity to, to be what it is. But between that and like our gozas, I mean, our gozas are all about 125, 126 calories. So there is a very, you know, active lifestyle, you know, opportunity that um, I want to, I want to get into, I do a lot of hiking. I do, you know, a bunch of, have done, don't have the time as much anymore, but a bunch of obstacle course stuff, Spartans and go rucks. And, Tough mutter and yeah. 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 That was, that was the gateway drug. That was my boot amber was Tough mutter. And then I got into all kinds of other stuff. So, but I go out, I mean, every morning at five o'clock in the morning and put on a 75 pound backpack and go hike two miles. Um, oh wow! So it's like like getting outside, and like this kind of a beer is like the perfect, you know, kind of it's a recovery beer, and uh, so really like kind a diet of, beer that's not 
it's like a light beer that's not light. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a Michelob Ultra that tastes like a craft beer, really, is what it is. What's and the color on that beer? I'm really interested. I haven't tried that one. It's, um, it looks like, uh, right. looks like a dark lager. I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's dark brown to dark brown to black. Um, How can I get my hands on some of that? Uh, we just brewed another, actually, we just brewed another batch, and this time we gluten reduced it. So um, we're going to have a new batch of it there. If you get uh, down to Boonville, I can probably get you some out of here. Um, all of our beers, uh, they're on our website. We just redid our website kind of as, a, as an interim thing. We're doing, uh, uh, we're going through a process of um, doing a package sort of redesign and, and a rebranding. But in the interim, we upgraded the technology on our website uh, just, just to make sure that it was working correctly. There's a, there's a find our beer link. And uh, you can plug in your address, and you can even select different products, and it will duck you into the closest thing. But if you can't find it, let me know, and I'll I'll figure something out. For you. Excellent. It's like like that that kind of stuff. I mean, going you know the the active lifestyle side of things is you know Huge. I think is key. I mean, and particularly it's like I mean Hendy Woods is just down the street, and you know the the you know, we do the Fish Rock race here, and um, like two years ago, Lance Armstrong came in second in the fish rock, you know, kind of gravel road <laughs> hybrid. Right? I mean, like, like, how do people not know about this? I mean, Lance Armstrong <laughs> came in second on a bicycle race that we host at the brewery and nobody was, nobody was, was talking about it. And it was, it was I didn't hear about promoters. that. Yeah. It was the promoters are bike monkey. Great guys. They also do the grand fondo and stuff. And I'm like, why, why, how did, how did the brewery not totally get, you know, behind? So we had some plans. We had to cancel it this year, but we had some plans to like, you know, make sure that the gate at the, the brewery was the start finish line and, you know, try and bring as much stuff, you know, onto the property and try and just support the race as much as we can at the brewery and wherever we can do and had all kinds of fun stuff planned and then we had to cancel it. But. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, you guys have such a great location in that Anderson Valley region, but there, there is sort of, you know, up in like the Humboldt County, they call it the Redwood Curtain. I would say there is some barrier to get it, like deep into Mendocino like that. Um, and that's probably why uh, not as many people come out there and stumble upon your brewery. Um, I mentioned earlier, my introduction was the beer festival. Mm -hmm. And actually, we do a, a college reunion there every year. So there was a, we call each yeah. other the boonies. We're the boonies. <laughs> And it's just become a great place that, you know, everyone kind of lives all over the place. And so we can all meet there every year. And so there was a hole missing in my life this year. Um, oh. But uh, I just wanted to finish with, uh, with making sure that it's uh, going to happen next year. It, you know, obviously, if uh, everything uh, gets better, do we have the beer festival coming again next year? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. No, one of the, the tough things about the beer festival is that um, – the brewery actually doesn't really make any money off the beer festival. They're close. I mean, like, they'll, like we'll, we'll sell beer out of the tap room and it's a big time for the tap room, but um, we sell a lot of beer. I mean, all of the money from the beer festival goes to the foundation uh, and then yep. the foundation distributes it among local charities. And so the big, the big, um, the big issue this year with that is that um, I have, I have a hole that I want to fill um, in terms of the, the philanthropy that the brewery has traditionally been able to contribute to the community that we're not able to do this year. So, so I'm trying to figure out other ways to do it. We have a, uh, we have a promotion right now. So uh, a portion of the proceeds from all of our um, IPA, the Blico Pale and the Boonville Gold, we're donating to the Community Foundation of Mendocino's COVID-19 fund. And uh, we're trying to, to, to contribute what we can you know, that way and then trying to figure out just what we can do you know over the course of the year to try and replace some of that we've got a circus scheduled to come in october uh, that's the other thing we're, i'm planning on I mean, i've got 30 acres in the brewery i've got to be able to do something fun here so we're, yeah. we're doing anything that seems like a good idea i'm green lighting um even if it's not it's like yeah it's a horrible idea we we can probably fit you in in an hour yeah. um but uh trying to do do as much as we can that way in order to try and take, you know, like, like we would, you know, we, we, uh, it's the, um, God, I forgot the name of the circus, uh, um, 
Flint Creek Circuits. Uh, so I mean, they're they're paying for you know, the space by you know doing something, and we're taking all that money, and all that's going to the foundation, and and, and that's going to go into philanthropy, um, and just trying to find creative ways to to try and backfill some of the some of the funds that we would have been able to donate, and uh, that's kind of a that's that's a total bummer. Um, we want to be you know we want to be good neighbors, and like I said, this is my last job. I mean, the whole purpose of buying these. I mean, we don't have any investors. My dad owns 100% of the company. My job is to make my dad proud. That's it, you know. And, you know, 25 years from now, you know, hand the, the company off to my daughter or someone else in my family. And the idea is we want to run this as a multi-generational thing and be part of what's going on here and, and really kind of be meaningful and just, you know, honorable, straight up folks in, in what we're doing. And, and that's a big part of it is you know, being able to, to, to have that you know, beer fest. It's a lot of work, but it's totally worth it. And, you know, make, we're, we're absolutely going to be doing the beer festival for as long as you know, Great. they have us. And um, that's, a, that's an, important, it's an important thing, you know, first, just because um, it, it lives in the memories of so many people. Uh, and, uh, and that's, you know, important in itself. But the other thing is that it really does help the community and we're able to, to do some meaningful stuff with it. So it's absolutely going to yeah. happen. Yeah. I, I probably had been going there for a decade before I found out that all the proceeds were going to nonprofit. So, um, obviously, I mean, not that I needed another reason to go, but I mean, <laughs> it's just an amazing, amazing time. So, uh, well, thank you, Kevin. We really appreciate you joining us today. We're huge fans. Um, you know, I, I do appreciate you keeping these breweries local um, because it's not an easy thing to do, uh, but I, I think you have a really good vision and um, I support it. So how can people go and support you and purchase your beer uh, moving forward, especially right now? You know, um, we are not open to uh, direct to consumer uh, stuff. We are not shipping um, and we're not allowing people to come to the brewery and buy. Instead, we're encouraging everybody to go to their local craft beer retailer. And if you end up up in Boonville, um, I think our website uh, uh, and social media, there's you know four different places around here. We're really encouraging people to go to their local craft beer retailer because they've got families, they've got employees, um, our distributors of families and employees. We need you know a, a very healthy you know, chain uh, to do that. And so rather than, than, than selling direct to people, we're encouraging everybody to go to the local stores and do that kind of stuff. And that said, if you go to the website, it's uh, avbc.com. Uh, there's in the upper right-hand corner is a little red button you can click. It says, find our beer, put in your address or your friend's address or wherever you happen to be. And it'll vector you into to everything that we've got um, and who's selling it. And, uh, um, how far away it is and get you directions and um, makes it as easy as possible to buy beer. So Absolutely. Well, Kevin, you are, and I mean this in the nicest way, you're a sobering voice in the craft beer industry <laughs> here in NorCal. Uh, we look forward to supporting you and Anderson Valley uh, for years to come. So thank you for your time. We appreciate it. No, thanks, guys. Is there anything we can do? I mean, if you get in the area, give me a shout. I'll show you around. And, um, if we can be helpful, let me know. Okay. Thanks to Kevin for joining our podcast. Great talking with him. He has a super interesting story. You know, for me, I'm just, I'm just glad that he's keeping NorCal beer local. I really liked it when he, you know, you're like, how can we support you? And he's like, honestly, like right now, like we're kind of shut down, go to your local you yes. know, beverage facility and just buy local beer. I thought that was really awesome. I mean, if everyone acted that way and just said, look, let just, let's all support local. Trust me, it comes back. And I just think he's so right. And he, he wants to market it as a local beer and it's, it's just something you don't see every day. So that's super refreshing. Uh, go support, uh, Anderson Valley Brewing Company. Their Boont Amber Ale is delicious. And, um, we're looking forward to going to the Boonville Beer Festival, uh, next, next year. year, maybe learn some bootling in the time. All right. That does it for this episode. Uh, we'll be back in your eardrums next week. So we're going to revive our NorCal feature film series. So basically, our top 10 
our top 10 movies filmed in Northern California podcast is like, it is our most downloaded. People keep uh, complimenting me on it. So we're just going to expand on it. If this is what you guys want to listen to, we're going to do it. So we are going to just start picking films filmed in Northern California that highlight NorCal scenery you know, inside of the plot of these movies. And these are big movies. These are blockbuster movies. We're talking Star Wars. We're talking E.T. We're going to break them down super deep. We're going to go into the local stories behind them through a NorCal lens. And so we'll probably announce this on social, which one we're going to do. So you can go and watch it and then listen to the podcast. That's how I think we should probably go about this. Um, it's up to you. You can listen to us however you'd like, but we're not, and we're not going to go in any particular order. We're just going to pick whichever one we feel like doing that week. And there's a lot, there's, you know, there's 25 that we really could go into, I think like popular good movies. So we're going to start that next week. Stay tuned. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, subscribe guys, subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. We're everywhere. So you don't miss anything. Follow us on social. We're going to have all this video. It's going to be a ton of fun. Um, until next week, thanks for listening. And remember, stay active. NorCal, we're hella NorCal. And I could spend all day just chilling in the South Bay. We're NorCal, we're hella NorCal. And Darren knows how to do to kick it down in Santa Cruz. We're NorCal, we're hella NorCal. And we get a little cray cray when we visit the East Bay. We're NorCal, we're hella NorCal. And we get a little mental when we visit Sacramento. Yeah, we're NorCal. We're hella NorCal. And we punch out in Nature's County when we visit Humboldt County. Yeah, we're NorCal. We're hella NorCal. And me, I'm hella cool because I live in Sebastopol. We're NorCal. We're hella NorCal. And you know that we gotta go. We're on our way to Tahoe.